Welcome to the Chess Angle. This is not your typical chess podcast. If you're an amateur or club level player, the Chess Angle is for you. Our content is aimed at busy adults who are serious about the game but have limited study time. Featured guests include both amateur and titled players alike. And now, here's your host, director of the Long Island Chess Club, Neil Bellon. Welcome, everyone, to Season 5. It's great to be back. Some quick production notes. First, on our YouTube channel, I'm looking into posting video versions of our interview episodes rather than just having audio with a still image. That's in beta, so to speak, but it is something I'm working on. Also, I'm going to be experimenting with chapter markers as part of the show notes. That's also in beta, but I'm looking into adding that feature as a permanent fixture. I'll talk more about this and some other ideas when I do my first solo episode of the season. My guest this week to kick off season five needs no introduction and is a popular figure in both the chess and business worlds. I am, of course, referring to James Altucher. James is a national chess master, successful podcaster and entrepreneur, and a best-selling author. His podcast, The James Altucher Show, which is part of my own weekly podcast rotation, is a top show that receives millions of downloads on a regular basis. He is the author of 18 books, including The Power of No and Choose Yourself, which were Wall Street Journal bestsellers. I was honored to speak with James recently, and the bulk of our conversation was about adult improvement, especially as we get older, and James's quest to get back to a rating of 2200. That's coming up right now. So James, good to see you. Really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Definitely. So I'm going to jump right in. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about your current tournaments, like what kind of events you're playing in. And sure. So let me just start off by saying, just real quickly, I started playing in tournaments when I was 17 years old, so kind of late to the game. And then, of course, I, I stopped in college because girls... <laughs> And then I, I picked it up again, uh, kind of in between jobs later on. And when I finally hit the age of about, I guess, 28, I hit uh, master level, like 2200 strength. And I played in a few tournaments after that. I got, I got up to about 2249, I think was my peak. And then I remember two tournaments specifically gave me heartache. I was having a good run. This is back in 1997. I was having a really good run of, of not losing against people my level, like 2,200 or so. And then I had two games in a row, one where I played this little kid. I don't know if he was like 10 years old, 11 years old, and he was beating me. And there was this other tiny little kid who couldn't see the board. He was about six or seven years old. I don't know. He couldn't see the board. So he kept jumping up to see the board. And then after the game was over, which I had lost, uh, this other little kid who was like six or seven years old was like showing us all these moves that we both should have done. And that was Hikaru. And I figured, oh my gosh, these kids are getting better than ever. What's going on here? And then in the next tournament I played in was a, a local tournament at the Manhattan Chess Club. And uh, I I uh, lost the game, and the girl who won the game uh, told me maybe on move nine you shouldn't have moved Bishop B four, and I was and this was the thirteen year old Irina Crush, and so I figured you know what I'm I'm done I'm retired I I had fallen from twenty two forty nine to a little above twenty two hundred, and I decided you know what. Being above 2200 is kind of important for my career just because of the culture. This is, you know, I was whatever, 27 years old, 28 years old. It was early on in my career. And it was 25 years ago or a little longer, 26 years ago now. And it does have some cultural significance uh, being a master. I didn't realize you take the master title with you once you get it. No matter what your rating is, you're still like a national master. So I didn't want to lose that title. So I stopped playing and it was all, it's only in the past 
year and a half, almost coming on two years now that I decided, hey, I'm going to make a quest of this, which is can't everybody says I can't, but can someone in their 50s now get back to where they were before? And so many people kept telling me, no, no, it's impossible. Your brain's older. These kids are geniuses. They're computers now. And their study techniques are different, blah, blah, blah. And of course, when someone tells you you can't, you feel like, oh, I really should. And chess is always something I loved. And I figured, you know what? Why not be, pursue my childhood love now as, a, as an adult, as a seasoned adult? And I'll tell you, Neil, it is difficult. I've done a lot of difficult things in my life for better or for worse, this is like difficult. It is really hard. I don't know if I could do it, but I'm still trying. Yeah. And the players just seem so much stronger, even defensively as well. Like, do you find that? Cause everything is like, you know, these young kids with tactics, but I'm finding even on the other end of the board, even defensively and positionally, they're a lot stronger because tradition, traditionally, excuse me, the kids, it was always like tactics, 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 attack, but it seems like they can also play solid and defend as well. Do you find that? Do they play solidly? I mean, there's, I've, I've done so much research on all of this, like what actually does change in the brain between the ages of 27 and 55, which is what I am now. And I've explored issues of memory, calculation, even my strategic sense and how the brain works with strategy versus calculation. But to answer your question, I think the kids are better defenders now than they were then. First off, there weren't that many kids in tournaments then. Now you go to a tournament, it's 70% kids. Back then it was maybe 80% adults, 20% kids. But that leaving that aside, I think the younger kids are just, they're better tactically, they have better memories, they, 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 they're better at the openings. So sometimes I get crushed in the openings, which has never used to happen to me before. Openings is studied in a much different way now than it was in the 90s. And... You know, there, there's other aspects too. I don't think they're that great at strategic play, and I don't think they're that great at end games. I mean, of course, there's exceptions. I'm not making a, uh, I'm making a huge generalization, but I think there are some aspects of the game where I've improved in ways that I don't see the kids really developing skills because they don't have to because their their calculation is so great and their opening knowledge is so great that. Uh, and I do think they have a better basic positional sense than when I was starting out. Maybe not, well, let's say the 2200s are the equivalent of 2400 tactically and 2000 positionally from, from when I was playing. And the tactics count for more, for better or for worse. Now, what is your study regimen look like? In other words, you're trying to get back to 2200 now. What does that look like for you as far as studying? Are you just mostly playing? Are you studying and doing both? Are you studying anything specific? I'm I'm studying and playing. I think you need to study and play. If let's say you're trying to get better at I don't know archery, you can't just read a bunch of books about archery and suddenly hit the target the first time you go to an archery range. You you have to play. You have to analyze your games. You have to study the classics. You have to study openings. You have to study tactics. You have to study end games. And you know I've changed my regimen quite a bit in the past year and a half. But I would say like right now today, it's um, let's say an hour of tactics a day, maybe an hour of looking at classical games. And then I'll play six, five plus three blitz games. So five plus three is five minutes plus three second increment after each move. I'll, I'll analyze those, which I'll then later go over with a coach. So I work with uh, Avertic Gregorian. You can find him at chessmood.com. I've worked with many coaches over the years. All of them have been great. I've never worked with a bad coach. And um, just lately, I've been working with Avatic and it's going very well. And uh, and that's about it. I'll, I'll, you know, a combination of classic study, uh, positional study, tactics, end games. And now I don't study as much openings, but about six months ago, I was studying like 80% openings just because I was switching my repertoire. Right. And what does that look like now? Like, do you have a set opening repertoire? Like, I'm just going to stick with these or are you mixing that up a little bit? I have a, so, so when I hit 2200 back in 1997, I only played D4 and I had a very specific repertoire. I I had one line for, you know, the Nimzo, for the King's Indian, for the Benoni. 
And then I, I used to play the King's Indian against Pawn to Queen 4 and the Modern Defense against Pawn to King 4. And that was it. And I only studied those from the ages of 17 to whenever it is I stopped, 27 or 28 years old. And, but then when I restarted, I decided I'm going to switch everything because right away I saw that the openings were completely different than when I was like King's Indian. I had one plan, which is, uh, you know, get into a lock center, then do F5, F4, G5, G4, uh, sack on H3 with my bishop and checkmate. That was my only plan. <laughs> and, you know, with D4, let's say I played a Queen's Gambit, uh, my only plan it was like to do knight g2. I think this is now called the Bodvinic plan, but knight g2, knight g3, f3, e4, uh, maybe e5, f4, f5, check, sack something and checkmate. These were like my only plans. <laughs> and and now I'm playing pawn to king four, and I'm, I switched also my the, my responses to black, and it's a completely different game. It is like comparing apples and oranges. It's like I'm playing. I went from playing checkers to playing chess, or maybe that's not a fair comparison because D4 is not chess. It's like switching from checkers to backgammon. It's like I'm playing a completely different yeah. game um, because the positions are much wilder. They're much more open. Um, there's different sorts of plans. So I've had to expand not only my repertoire of openings, but my repertoire of plans that I understood. There was very few plans I had to understand when I was younger playing D4. And also that's just the nature of how openings are studied now too, that everybody studies every line. So I remember I was still, when I first started playing again, after this 25 year break, I was still playing the King's Indian. And then Gawain Jones would come out with a new course on a Friday on Chessable about the King's Indian. And on Saturday, you know, let's say it's the national open in Las Vegas, suddenly everybody's playing the newest lines that came out the day before. So these Younger people, I'll say, instead of, instead of kids, they have phenomenal memories. They absorb all the lines they need to know. And I feel like I used to be able to do that when I was younger, but I didn't even need to do it that much. People didn't really study the openings as detailed as they do now. Like, like when I was younger, I had a book by Geller called The King's Indian Defense. That was my studying of The King's Indian. <laughs> now it's there's chessable courses. There's the computer lines. There's 6,000 games played a day in your obscure 20 move sideline variation that you thought you were the only one who, who knew it. But not only does everyone know it, everyone's also studied your games playing it. So like studying the openings is a different beast, which has its pros and cons, which we can get into. And so I figure, where am I going to get my edge? Because again, it used to be if you had a good position, Yes, sometimes people could defend, but most of the time people just rolled over and died. And I don't want to say that's all the time, but on my way up from like 1800 to 2000 to 2200, that's what my experience. Like I, I won the under 2000 in the world open. I won the under 2200 in the world open. I had a pretty smooth ride up. And now just, it's, it's just difficult. Like you could play a 1500 rated kid who, will have spurts of playing like a 2200 because uh, they'll either know the opening really well or you get into some tactical situation they've studied a million times on puzzle rush and but where, where where i figured i could have my edge is doing something i've never done before which is studying end games and positional stuff and just just as an example like uh i when i was when i was younger even in my 20s I never under I never studied any positional stuff at all. I didn't know what a space advantage meant. I I was 20, over 2200. I didn't know what a weak square was or how to play with a, you know against a weak square. I didn't need to. And maybe that's why I stopped at 2250. I don't know, but now I th this is like a huge a area of study for me is is studying these more positional aspects, studying classical games which I never really did before and really trying to expand my, for, for, you know, let's call it chess wisdom. And I, I feel younger people don't have that as much because they have, they have that raw, let's call it athleticism of the tactics and the opening knowledge. Now, a lot to unpack there. I want to explore two areas. I want to talk about uh, your studying with uh, your coaches, your current coach. And I know you had studied with Jesse Cry. 
And then I want to get into some ideas about chess improvement, like over the age of 50, right? Because you said you're 55. Is that right? Yeah. All right. I'm 51. So we're old. We're quote unquote old. <laughs> but I want to I want to mention I am the, the Georgia over 50 champion right now. And when I was a kid, I was the New Jersey junior champion. So I'm proud that I've bookended. Uh, I, I, I wish I had played in the middle 25 years, but unfortunately, uh, it is what it is. So I feel like among, you know, my cohort, you know, people over 50, I'm doing well. But when I'm in a, an intense tournament situation, like the Chicago Open, National Open, World Open, it's, it's really hard. It's a different experience for me than when I was younger. Right. Now, let me hold on a second. Let, let me sort of interject with this before we get into the other things. When you play in these major tournaments with classical time controls, do you play in every game or do you take buys? Because there's some thought that, you know, once you get to a certain age because of the endurance that you should just you should take some strategic buys to give yourself a rest. Do you do that or do you play every game? I play every game because if I'm going to travel someplace spend money on a hotel and all that kind of stuff. I'm playing every game. You know why? Because I'm not there to win that tournament, although that would be nice. I'm not there to win every game, although that would be nice. But I do want to learn from every game. And if I don't play the game, I'm not going to learn. So so I've, if I am going to a nine-round tournament, the Chicago Open, I'm playing a bunch of 2200s and all, all over. sometimes I'll play GM, sometimes I'll play lower rated. Uh, I I want to learn from every single game. Uh, otherwise, I'm wasting my money there. But do you think it would be? I, I'm just curious. Not not to. I don't want to sound like I'm pushing back on this. I'm just curious. I understand that point. Do you think your results would be better if you did take some buys though? Because that that's something that I feel for myself. If I were to do that, I think I would do better. But do you think it would be the same, and that you would just be wasting around, or do you think it might actually help you in the games you do play? It's a really good question. I don't know. I mean, I do know this is that my stamina does seem to wear out. Like if, like when you're playing, for some reason, my games tend to be like, like I'm, I'm usually like the last one in the playing hall, if, even if there's like 500 people there. So, so if you're playing, if it's 11 p.m. at night and you're on the 10th hour of play that day, my stamina is not going to be as strong as my opponents. And that's, but you know, I'm also trying to learn how to have more stamina or how to play well, even when my stamina is down. So those are all learning points as well, that, that hopefully I can increase my stamina by putting myself in those difficult, you only learn when you get put yourself in a difficult situation. So yes, those are difficult situations, but I'm trying, I'm trying to learn. And, and this is different also about my chess learning. Now it used to be, did I learn the openings? Did I study tactics? Now it's, did I get good sleep? Did I is my diet good? So I have the stamina. Did I uh, eat properly right before the the game? You know, or, or two hours before the game, so I'm not digesting while playing. Did I exercise enough to increase stamina? So all these things now are on my mind. Where I could have cared less when I was younger. I didn't even think about all these things. I didn't even think about from end games to diet to sleep. You know, I now have to think about. Like, Neil, let me ask you this. Have you ever played in like, a, so I play in some locally, I'll play in like, you know, rapid, you know, like 30 minute tournaments and I'll, I'll run out of time without even looking at the clock. Like I'll remember, oh, I looked at the clock when I had six minutes left. I'm fine. Then the next thing I know, my opponent flags me. It's like an old man move. Well, those game thirties. Yeah. Cause those game thirties are dual rated, but I tried those many years ago and like I got crushed those ratings. I don't know. I'm not a fan of those dual rated. I think that's one of the best ways for people to like actually lower their rating. I mean, what do you, do you play a lot of those? Uh, they call, what do they call those action? I, I play, I do play a lot of those. I do play a lot of those. And so, you know, it's one thing losing on time in a 30 minute, which is like you say, is both classical and rapid rated, but it's another thing where the last six minutes of play, I was just so focused on what move I was making. I didn't even look at the clock. So that's a skill is time management. I never had to think about before because I was always just moving fast like any other young person. And now I'm losing on time if I don't regularly look at the clock. Like I have to look at the clock and I have to calculate, oh, this game is going to probably go another 15 moves. I've got three minutes. So I need to basically spend 
no more than 10 to 15 seconds on average per move. I have to actually think about these things. And I never had to think about that before. I mean, do you like those game 30s? Like when you join it, you're like, yeah, cool game 30. Or do you just do it? Or because so, some people actually prefer that they like that. Some people like myself, I'm, I'm just curious, like, do you enjoy those game 30s? I do. But here's my general thinking. And the one thing I might regret is that I didn't stick to playing online a little bit more and I went straight into over the board tournaments in this sort of comeback journey, but it's all correlated, right? You're not gonna be 1600 at 30 minute and 2000 at classical. You're gonna be, you know, the same, you're gonna be 1600 in both, or you're gonna be 2000 in both. You're gonna be, your lead chest, your chess.com, your over the board classical, your over the board rapid, they're all gonna be roughly the same within a hundred points of each other. And so if you get better at any one of those, maybe bullet is the one exception. If you get b better at blitz, you're going to get better at classical and vice versa. I mean, when I was hitting 2250 in 1997, it meant my performance ratings were over 2300 and I was beating 2300s at blitz all of a sudden. So I, I enjoy it all except bullet. You know, sometimes I get carpal tunnel syndrome if I play that. So I, I try not to play that. And I think there's value in all from blitz on up. And by blitz, I mean five plus three. From blitz on up, I think there's value. There's learning, there's educational value in, in everything. Like, you know, and, and classical, you're thinking of so many ideas and so many plans. You know, it's so great to to study those deeply. Whereas blitz, I'll just study, you know, the opening and and what plan did I come up with and what might have been a better plan. And I'll go over them with every blitz game I play, I go over with my coach. And of course, every over the board game. Okay. So speaking of your coach, I want to go back to the original uh, topics I mentioned. You had studied, correct me if I'm wrong, you studied with GM Jesse Cry for a while, yeah. correct? And can you tell us, yeah, tell us a little bit about that. So when I was like 18 or 19, I played in the US Junior Open and the young Jesse Cry was also playing and he was about 2,300. Uh, and I beat him in r round one or round two. I still remember the game. I like sacked my queen. And I remember thinking, this guy is a really nice, polite, good person. Like here I had this great attack, sack the queen, one. First thing he does is he like hit, you know, talks to the people playing all around us. Like, oh my gosh, did you see what this guy just did? Like he was bragging about my move to other players. I thought that was a really good sportsmanship way to play. And we had been Facebook friends, you know, all along, you know, obviously Facebook wasn't made then, but, you know, in the past 15 years, we've been Facebook friends. So at one point I saw him, you know, online with Twitch. I, I, we played a little bit and then I asked him to give me lessons. He was very good. He has a very classical approach. It's very much focused on um, positional play. And he, he really uh, likes to go over the class. We could spend weeks going over one classical game that I play, which is good. Like that's a certain kind of studying and we go really deep into studying a, a, a classical game. But I really needed to get up to speed in, you know, make sure my openings didn't have major holes and make, you know, make sure I understood enough of the plans in a new opening that, that, so, so I needed kind of like quantity almost, of course, quality, but I really needed quantity. And, um, the the with Avatik Gregorian, uh, he, he we, you know with him, I play let's say six blitz games a day, so about uh whatever it is forty blitz games a week, and then once every week or so I'll have a bunch of over the board games, and we go over we we meet once a week, and sometimes it'll be a six hour lesson, but we go over every blitz game, and it's just bam 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 like in in this opening. There's this plan, this plan, this plan, and this plan. And we'll go over all of them, just like quantity. And then I'll I'll forget them the next week. We'll go over it again. And then I'll write them down, like, which ones am I remembering? Which ones am I, I am I forgetting? He'll give me homework, so I'll get, like, the a next day. If, if I was really bad on winning one position, so he'll give me a bunch of positions, you know, white to move and win a one position. Or if I'm having problems defending lost positions, he'll give me exercises on that. Or if I'm having problems understanding why a bishop pair is better than a bishop and a knight, he'll give me problems on that. So I should mention that a lot, you know, some of my study each day involves uh, this homework and also 
he'll send me back the games we analyze and I'll write down the things that I'm having trouble remembering. I should also mention I took le uh, memory lessons from the world memory champion, like Chessabo helped set that up for me. And uh, that was very interesting. I I've spoken to, I don't want to say I've had lessons from lots of coaches, but I've spoken to a lot of people about improvement at this age. Now, well, now tell me a little bit about that memory lessons. Like give me a little snapshot of what that looks like. So if I was trying, like if, if I was trying to remember a super tactical line of let's call it, you know, the Alakine defense, uh, I was having trouble remembering. And, you know, then I would remember a line and then somebody would prepare for me and no five computer lines deeper, <laughs> you know, computer moves deeper and just cause they had better memories. So with, with this guy, uh, and this was about a year ago, we'd work on how to kind of store memory, the opening variations in what's called a memory palace, which is a, 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 a technique used by memory champions. But it was good. I did memorize those variations, but what's been much better for me is really bulk understanding all the plans in a certain type of position. Like I said before, in the King's Indian, there, there, I had one plan. Well, now if I were to play the King's Indian, I'd also understand, you know, okay, there's also opportunities to get play on the C file. There's opportunities when they exchange EF, GF, so you can't do your normal kingside pawn storm. So I'd under, I understand more plans. Every opening has dozens of plans and nuances associated with it that I really wasn't aware of before. Now let's get into chess improvement as, you know, a quote unquote older adult, say over the age of 40, or in our case, over the age of 50. Do you feel, you touched on this a little bit, but let's kind of take a deeper dive. Do adults, quote unquote, like age out of improvement? Does it, do you think it gets to a point where you can only improve so much? And then as part of that question, you do have people who claim to spend hours and hours studying and they're buying all the books and yet you know, they've been rated 1400 for like 15 years straight. Like, what are your thoughts on that? It's almost really two questions. And I'll, I'll deal with, I'll start with the first one, which is do older people plateau? And I don't think the end, I think the answer is definitively no, but it gets harder. And because for lots of reasons, one is the brain. So again, through this journey, I've talked to neuro neuroscientists, I've talked to psychologists, I've talked to performance coaches. Um, so on the neuroscience side, the brain does change. So things like memory and raw calculation uh, start to decline no matter what. Like I can say my memory is still exceptionally good, but not good enough, not as good as it was when I was hitting 2200 back in the day. And memory just simply declines. Like how often you make it to the afternoon and you forgot what you had for breakfast that day. Like that starts to decline when you're like 40 or even in your thirties. And, um, you know, we, you, you see this all the time. Like with why, why do kind of the older world champions who come back to play, they switch from playing the sharpest Sicilians to knight F3, G3, you know, D3, B3, you know, because those are a, a little easier to get a position and then they figure it out. So that that's neither good nor bad, but, you know, maybe that's a technique I have to go, do eventually, but so far I haven't been doing that. But the other thing that changes is your raw calculation ability. And it's not just in chess, by the way, you see this in, you know, mathematics, for instance, the peak age for a professional mathematician is 25 years old. Uh, that might be the peak age for a chess player. You know, Magnus is in his 30s, uh, but he, you know, he's the world champion. He might be an exception. You know, typically the, the most of the people in the top 10 or top 20 are, are people in their 20s. There's when I turned 40, I remember I was like, oh, I'm an old man now. And I looked at the top 20 chess players, and the only one over 40 at that time, I think, was was Anand. Uh, and so everybody else was under 40 and on, on to his credit is still like a top 10 or top 20 player. He's amazing. But, um, uh, but what improves with age people, people don't realize, and maybe this is kind of more new discoveries. The brain does improve as it gets older. There, there's something called neuroplasticity, which is the brain's ability to learn new things. 
you're, you still have neuroplasticity, it's just in different parts of the brain. And so what does improve, and this is gonna sound weird, and it only improves if you work at it, is wisdom. So for instance, I'll give an example. His, the peak age for historians, now remember the peak age for mathematicians, 25. The peak age for a historian is 69. So, and the peak age for writers in their 60s. And the reason is, is that, is that your ability to recognize patterns in many disparate areas and then combine them to form cohesive theories becomes better. So you might say to yourself, oh, the air conditioner was invented in 1900. I don't know if it was, but let's just say the air conditioner was invented in 1900. Southern urbanization started to happen in the early 1900s, like skyscrapers started to be built. Well, then you can make the connection. Air conditioning, which heat cools down the highest floors, uh, enabled urbanization to happen in the South, which cre increased the economic development of the United States and led to a booming, you know, innovative United States for the next century with, with innovations happening both North and South. So historians make those connections and connect those dots and then write good books about it and refer to other books and refer to other things. And, and in chess, the same thing could happen. Uh, like, oh, I saw this position it, on the black side of a Portuguese Scandinavian, but now it looks like I can do it in a, a, a Roy Lopez over here. So you make connections between plans and positions you saw in one game. Oh, I remember when Ulf Anderson played this versus Bobby Fischer, or Bobby Fischer played this versus Spassky. And you, you form more of these kind of wisdom connections. Now the question remains though, which is why, by the way, I'm, I study a lot more of the classical games than I've ever studied before. And I study a lot more end games than I ever did before because that's all pattern recognition. End games and these classical games, there are tactics, of course. You need tactics to win, but you need that pattern recognition. Oh, this is the time when I'd go King H1, Rook G1, G4, G5 and attack that way as opposed to F3, E4. Like you, you're, 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 you know, your pattern recognition for good positions versus bad positions is better. And so you don't need maybe as many tactics. The question is, is what you lose greater than what you gain or vice versa? And the, the theory is that what you lose is worse than what you gain. Losing memory and losing calculation is worse than what you gain. But again, you see among like older players, like older grandmasters and so on, they're able to play, you know, well, let's use an example of computers. There's the Stockfish style computer and there's the Alpha Zero style of computer. Stockfish looks at like, let's say 20 million moves in a second or 500 million moves in a second. Alpha Zero actually looks at relatively few moves, but it's evaluation function per move is much greater. And so, so it doesn't need to look as many moves. And it's the same thing when your pattern recognition and your quote unquote wisdom is good when you're older, you don't have to, you, the idea hopefully is that you don't have to have as many tactics. Although I do spend an hour a day on tactics. So I think that's what, when you're older, you kind of have to really learn new things. It's like I'm learning chess for the first time and learning things I never knew before. Like like what to do with the space advantage, never knew. What, what to do when you have bishop and bishop versus bishop and knight, never used to know. Didn't need to know. Didn't care. Which leads us to your own journey as someone trying to get back to 2200 over 50. I know you're writing a book about, about that, about your journey to do that. A lot of it is improvement over the age of 50. So can you tell us a little bit about, you know, the book and, you know, maybe give us a little sneak preview, what kind of things, you know, we'll see with that. It, th this has not just been a journey of improvement. It's really been an exciting quest for me back into this game and this subculture that I loved so much when I was, you know, 25, 26, 30 years younger. And so, so yes, initially I thought I was going to be just about, here's what I did. Like I had written this book called Skip the Line, which talks about how to learn things very quickly. And a lot of my, the neuroscience stuff and the psychological stuff and, and other things are, are included in that book, Skip the Line. And now I'm specifically applying it to chess. And I thought it'd be fairly straightforward. But, you know, also I will add that this has been such an exciting adventure 
you know, because I had a whole career for those 25 years, I wrote lots of books. I was, uh, you know, uh, like a hedge fund manager. I was on CNBC quite a bit. I wrote, I've written books about going broke and failing and coming back from that. So I built an audience from that. I've written books about entrepreneurship. So I, I have an audience of people from different, you know, I did stand up comedy and toured the country for six years. Uh, I've done lots of different things for better or for worse. I could be a jack of all trades, master of none is what my fear is. But, you know, when I first went to my, my, my first tournament coming back into this, like in December, 2021, I had readers of my books and listeners to my podcast come up to me and it was a nice feeling. And then new and chess magazine, which was my favorite magazine as a kid, asked me to start writing columns for them. And I couldn't believe it. Like, oh my gosh, new and chess. I'm, I mean, I'm a total imposter, uh, imposter syndrome on there. Like there'll be an article from Jan Timmen, then me, then Judith Polgar, which one doesn't belong. <laughs> and it's me. And, you know, I've, uh, you know, all along the way, I've, I've, you know, Gary Kasparov has been on my podcast a bunch of times. We've become good friends. Uh, you know, I just was in Norway speaking at the Norway Business Summit, but that was side by side with the Norway Chess Tournament. So I met a lot of the top players, had dinner with Magnus Carlsen, his dad, Peter Nielsen, his coach. And every day something new happens, which is part of this adventure and part of this, this journey. Um, of really immersing myself and in, in, again in a different way now as 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 an older person rather than as a young person it's different and that's been exciting it's been frustrating sometimes the the learning part because I'm not learning I mean so Peter Nielsen made, said something interesting to me and that's Magnus's coach Peter Nielsen said you know you might already be better than you were it's just that the chess world as a whole has is a lot better than it was 25 years ago. And so, you know, that that's worth thinking about. And I don't know how to measure that, but that's worth thinking about. I mean, I guess the way a little I mentioned that is how I do against other people in their 50s. But that's not really that accurate because who knows what they're what they've been doing these years. And it's just it, it's just been an interesting journey. I, I I spoke to one I am at the last. So I'm I'm representing Georgia in this senior championship coming up at the US Open. And last year I did as well. And I was speaking to one IM who was representing California. Elliot Winslow was an IM back in the 80s. And he told me he's 250 points lower than his peak. And he always thinks he's going to get back. And he never, and he says, and I and I know I never will now. And he said, Don't don't delude yourself into thinking you're going to get back. And so I'm not saying he's a naysayer. You know, that's his experience and 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 he might be right. I haven't made it back yet. But I did go down the list of everybody playing in that tournament. And there were a lot of people who were, you know, like there was my old coach, John Fedorowicz, was representing New York in that tournament. Everybody was 200 to 250 points lower than their peak. 100% of the people. I was going to add, we were talking a little bit about that in the pre-interview. Yeah, 200, that seems to be the magic number. Whenever people take a hit, that's like the magic number. Yeah, and I'm 200 points lower than my peak. Yeah, same here. I know I have more, no, I mean, but this could be self-delusion, but I feel like I have more knowledge, but it's really hard. It's just, re it's really hard playing in tournaments because of, you know, issues we spoke about earlier. It's real. The the kids now they're they're just super good tactically. Their their memories are great on openings. Every kid's got a coach, you know, because of Zoom. And you know, you call up somebody in you know a GM in whatever country. You could pay ten dollars an hour. I don't know <laughs> for lessons. And I mean, I know people who have former top ten players giving them lessons for hardly anything. And uh, it's a really different competitive environment. Hikaru does this one video a few months ago, I saw it, where he described how he would study openings in the year 2000 compared to how he studies openings now. And it reminded me, I the way I studied openings, you didn't really have to know everything. You just had to know kind of the basic ideas and you go out there and you play it. Now you have to know, you have to have huge files on every possible move. And that's, the kids do it, or I should say young people do it. Uh, it's It's just very hard to do. But we'll see. I mean, I, I again, I feel like I'm um, improving, but sometimes I just I have a lot of volatility. I'll I, that, 
I've beaten the highest rated players I've ever beaten during these, this past year and a half over the board, but I've also lost to the lowest rated players I've ever lost to, even when I first started playing back when I was 17. Now, that's something I wanted to ask you about. How are you at handling those tough losses? Like, do you find yourself tilting a lot? Because I know for me, that's a big problem. I'm just curious how you handle that. I do. Everybody tilts. I don't think there's a way to truly avoid it. Everyone gets upset. You, you play four hours a game, you're winning for three hours and 59 minutes, and then you make a blunder and lose. That is not going to be something you celebrate. It's going to be, it's going to feel painful and you should feel pain from it. You should feel, you know, a little bit of loss of respect for yourself. You lost the game. You should have won. And, and that pain will, will either drive you to quit as it did for me when I was 27 or 28, or it'll drive you to learn as I'm trying to do now. I mean, between that time when I last played chess and now I, built businesses. I sold them. I made money. But then I also went broke several times where I made a ton of money. And then I would just make very poor decisions with that money and go completely broke back to zero and have to do it all over again and then go completely broke again. So I've been through kind of ups and downs. And I realize, I realize that through time and persistence, you, you can learn from these mistakes, but you have to really try to, you don't, it's more important to break bad habits than to get good habits because what's really causing you to lose a one position is some bad habit. Like maybe you, you lack confidence or you, uh, you decided you were winning. You're already thinking about how you're going to show other people. Oh, look at my great win. And, and you forget it. You miss a tactic. You're not as focused or, or you don't focus as much on time management. You're just like bragging in your head to yourself, or this is me at least. And, so, so, you know, I try to tell, like last tournament I played in Chicago Open, I was just around 2,100. So I was really kind of, I had bounced off of my floor at 2,000 and in just like a month. And so I felt like, okay, I could really make a run now to 2,200. And then I lost the first seven games. <laughs> like that is brutal. And after like three or four, I called my wife and I'm like, you know, I, I just may have to give up. and. She didn't necessarily disagree, but she did say that, you know, I do have a tendency to bounce back from these moments. And I, I did try to transform it afterwards to like, wow, this is valuable. I'm bringing a treasure trove of material to my coach, like, because you learn more from losses than wins. So I'm certainly going to lear learn a lot this time from this tournament. So I try to reframe it and it's hard, but you know, I don't let myself really tilt and I, I have a tendency to win the last round or two in these tournaments. So I, I try not to tilt as much as my opponents because in the last round or two, everybody's sucking. So if you're, if you're, if you're sucking and you're playing people in the last round, they're sucking also. Yeah. You just have to suck less than the other guy. Yeah. Right. It's like that saying, like, you don't have to run. If a bear is chasing you, you don't have to run faster than the bear. You just have to run faster than the other people running from the bear. Yeah, exactly. Right. So James, I do listen to your podcast and one of my favorite episodes was Alex Benayan, where he talks about the third door yeah. as far as success. So for, for the uninitiated and James, correct me if I'm wrong, when you want to achieve something in life or get somewhere, there's essentially like, th like three ways. And he uses the analogy of getting into a nightclub, right? So you have the people, it's a small amount of people they're powerful. They know people. It's all politics. They can kind of have a connection. Most people aren't in that situation. That's one way. The other way is what most people do, which is they wait online like everybody else and they hope the bouncer lets them in. But then he talks about the third door, like you sort of find a window to kind of sneak in like a creative way. So is there like a third door? Because you know, I was thinking about this as it relates to chess. Is there sort of a third door that older adults can use to get better? Or is that a myth? They just have to study like anyone else. Like, are there hacks that someone over 50 can use as opposed to say like an energetic 20 year old? Yeah, that's a great question. And I don't fully, my, my initial assumption was yes, because this is very similar also to the theme of my book, Skip the Line. Like what he's really talking about is to get in the nightclub is you have to figure out a way to skip the line. And, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, one of my daughters 
was having trouble getting into college one year. She basically applied to 20 different colleges, got into zero of them. It's very competitive. And so I said to her, look, and she was very upset. And I said to her, look, why don't you take a year off and let's figure out an unusual, like, no, don't do charity. Don't do, don't have an A plus grade, like that That stuff doesn't matter. Everybody who applies to college has a 1600 SAT score now, whatever. Let's do something unusual. So I gave her a bunch of options, including chess actually, because there's very few, compared to men, there's very few women who are moving up the ranks in chess. I'm not saying women are not good at chess. I'm saying there's fewer, more women should play chess. There's fewer women doing it. So I gave chess as one of the options. She chose race car driving. So I sent her to a race car driving school. She got a race car driving license. She participated in some professional races. And lo and behold, next year she applies to college. She got into every college. Like, doesn't matter high, high, how high the tier. She is is going to Duke University right now. And, and, and I don't even approve of kids going to college, but that's a whole other story. But it was a skip the line technique. Like, who else was a professional, a female race car driver applying to college? She stood out. By the way, one of the reasons I stopped playing chess before I went below 2200 is I wanted for I I got jobs because of chess, I raised money for businesses because of chess, I raised money for hedge funds because of chess. I get I got introduced, you know, corporations hired me to be a speaker because I was a chess master. Like chess is important cultural significance, so it's a being strong at chess is a good skip the line technique in the Alex Benayan, you know, style. And so, okay, but now just for getting better at chess, you know, there's, there's a a couple of, a couple of, let's say third doors, but I, I, I don't think any of them work consistently. So for instance, if you learn a lot of gambits, you're going to win, you're going to win some games, particularly in blitz, just on those gambits. Like that'll add, you know, 50 to hundred rating points to you. If you, if you are good at memorizing all the obscure lines in like the Stafford Gambit, for instance. And it doesn't matter how many times grandmasters prove the Stafford Gambit is no good. If you're 1,800 or 1,900, 2,000, you're going to win a lot of games with the Stafford Gambit. Um, you know what the most successful move is in bullet uh, after E4, uh, G6, uh, D4, Bishop G7? The most successful opening move is Bishop H6. <laughs> so, because <laughs> uh, it's just like a, a, you'll you'll either win the bi- piece immediately, or if you're down a piece, you, it's not necessarily an immediate loss at bullet. Like you could still play on. So, you know, stuff like that is like almost a, a, a third door technique in in bullet. But I think my suspicion now is is that playing a good end game. And is is a, a for older people is a good third. I have won many more end games than I've won out of the opening, even though I studied opening. I know my openings very well. I'll win in the end game, and even from if if a young person even offers me a draw and they're a pawn ahead and totally crushing me, I, I'll refuse the draw because I'll, I know I'll know the end game better than them. And so now there's a famous quote between the opening and. The middle and the end game, there's the middle game. And, you know, so you have to know middle game strategies and plans as well. So that's a third door. If you know what to do with a bishop pair, that's like a little bit of a third door. And tactics are a third door. Like, so again, even though my tactical ability is probably worse than when I was younger, I try to keep it up there. I study it an hour a day. Avatik Gregorian, the coach I'm working with, he tells me he doesn't feel tactics are, you know, they're definitely worth studying, he says, but you really have to know positional middle game strategy to be 2200 and 2300 these days. And so I've been really focusing on that. But, you know, everybody has their opinion on this. Uh, and and I don't think we we know. And again, I, I'll tell you more when I hit 2200 again, what, what has really worked. Hopefully you will reach 2200 and we'll have you back on and we can discuss that journey, you know, getting up those extra 200 points. But James Appleter, really appreciate you coming on the podcast. It was an honor to speak with you. Thank you. Neil, thanks so much. And good luck on your own journey as well. Absolutely. Thank you. And for those of you listening at home, as always, I hope you win your next game. Have a great day, everyone.